He, uh, later, he came to me asking, can you tell me how I can know for sure that I'm saved? He wanted to know for sure. But it wasn't because I went to him. God moved on his heart. Now, I wish I could tell you all of my family are Christian. I wish I could tell you that, but I know they're not. Some are not. Now, friend, listen. It takes a lot of patience, a lot of love, and a lot of forgiveness to live in a family. Amen? A lot. When Jesus moves in, to that family. Many times. He's going after the whole bunch. You just watch and see. But sometimes. You're the only one. We have a friend down in Indonesia. She finished. I told you about her. She just finished 44 years in Indonesia. As a missionary. She's the only Christian in her family. Back in Alabama. But God has used her down there. You might be the only one. It's, and, and, um, and when we think about it, just like the blind man, we don't duplicate what happened in his life in the lives of others. God doesn't cut everybody out of the same stamp. Like a cookie. We don't all look the same. We don't all talk the same. We're not all from the same backgrounds. We're not all from the same belief system in the past. But Jesus is able to save all that will call on His name. Anyone. And friend, listen. You can be saved too. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can call on His name and He will save you. Amen? Amen? He will. I believe that. Now, here's another point I wanted to make about this. The real issue here, remember? The real issue in verse 17. What do you say about Him? Have you ever heard the, con the idea or the concept of the elephant in the room? The elephant is in the room. Nobody talks about the elephant, but it's obviously there. He's big. You can touch and see. The elephant's in the room. The question of Jesus is the elephant. Now, here's what people will do. They will try to get you to think about other things rather than the elephant. It's a distraction. They'll talk about, for instance, oh, the church. All they want is your money. Anything except talk about Jesus. You see? Oh, you know that church. I went to church for years. I was born in a Christian family. I had all of this time and everything. But all the church did was argue and cause problems. I'll never go to church again. But not talk about the elephant. The elephant in the room will always be there. You can't get around the fact of Jesus Christ. We can't imagine Him away. He's not going to disappear. He is the living Lord and Savior. You must answer the question, what do you say about Him? This is the real issue. By this time, the Jews had established a rule. Anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ will be put out of the synagogue. <clears throat> Why did they need a law to punish those that were associated with Jesus Christ? Why did they need a law like this? I think we have to ask the question today to countries and nations all over the world. 
Why is there the need of a law to silence people who talk about Jesus Christ? But yet, all over the world, countries and nations, governments, have these kind of laws. Why? It's not just the Pharisees. It's not just something in the Bible. It's something that has plagued the world since the beginning. Laws against God's people. Why was that needed? Well, I'm going to tell you why I think they have the law. One, because his teaching went against their traditions. Okay? Jesus' teaching went against their traditions. And I just call this grace versus works. Now, it didn't matter to Jesus whether it was the Sabbath day. It didn't matter to Jesus that this man was rejected from everyone else, blind since birth. What mattered to Jesus was that God loves that man and the man needed to be set free. That's what mattered. Grace. God's grace. But the works, the Pharisee and the synagogue law, said no working on the Sabbath. So because he's healing on the Sabbath, he's telling a man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Because of that, he's breaking the law of Moses. I don't think that was in the mind of Moses nor God when the Ten Commandments were given. Now you think about this. Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it all to bring God's grace to us. His teaching went against their tradition. Second, in their view, Jesus was poor and lacked the necessary credentials as a religious leader. Now, you don't see that in the story specifically, but it was definitely true uh, related to him because can anything good come out of Nazareth was the saying. The poor are from Nazareth, up in the north. The poor, you know. And the real issue is authority from God versus authority from men. Has God given him authority or man's authority? Which one will you choose? The parents at this point were fearing man rather than fearing God because of their uncertainty. They didn't realize all that had happened yet. This blind man that was healed was choosing to believe only God can do this. He's fearing God rather than man. No matter what the men are saying, God has done this to me. That was basically his testimony. Authority from God versus authority from men. Third, his actions condemned them. The way Jesus taught and the things Jesus did actually condemned the Pharisee. Convicted, condemned the Pharisee. They should have felt ashamed for their mind and their attitude and their actions. But they weren't feeling ashamed. Okay. Now, here's what people will do. You, you can listen to me. Here's what people will do. They, when convicted of their sin, they will build a wall, sometimes raise a voice, sometimes push away, sometimes say, I won't listen to that anymore, sometimes turn their back and go away. This is how people react in many different ways <clears throat> when convicted of their sin. In this case, when convicted, the Pharisee was angry, will apply the law here out of the synagogue. He's gone. Fourthly, personal experience is reliable testimony when sincere investigation has taken place. Personal experience. In verse 30, the man answered and said, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, 
But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, he hears Him. Since the world began, it is... It has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said, you are completely born in sins and you are teaching us. And they cast him out. Boy, he gave them a tough sermon. This reminds me of Stephen. Just before Stephen was stoned, he was very bold. Just before he was stoned. They cast him out. In other words, the Pharisees were not being reasonable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. <laughs> Obviously. You know, one of the signs in the Old Testament of the coming Messiah, one of the prophecies, the blind would see. That was one of the Isaiah's prophecy. The blind would see, the lame would leap. The deaf would hear. These were signs that the, the Messiah had arrived. Well, when He came, many people recognized that. And it looks like this man is recognizing it. But many people rejected it too. Second, scriptural support of personal testimony strengthens this evidence. Now, these passages here, and you can write them down if you want to, these verses are related to answer to prayer, how the godly pray and God hears them. And that was this man's, part of this man's testimony. He said in verse 31, God does not hear sinners. That is a teaching from the Psalms. If a man regards sin in his heart, God will not hear. That means that the man's going to hold on to his sin. God's not going to hear and answer those prayers. This is why many people will argue at God and say, God doesn't answer prayer. Or there's no God or He would answer this prayer. That kind of argument. But the Scriptures are clear that if we're going to hold on to our sin, God's not listening. And so that was one of the arguments of this man. He's, a true, he's, he's thinking Jesus is a true prophet because... When he prays, God answers, see, and he, his eyes were open. And so there's uh, three, I think, passages, three or four passages. And even in the New Testament, we'll look at 1 John 3. Let's look at that one. You can look the others up, jot those down and look those up. 1 John 3. Uh. Thank you for being patient here. First John 3, 21. He says, If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God that whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. This is His commandment that we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Wow. Remember, Jesus said, and I think we read it already in John, which we studied it. He said, I always do what pleases the Father. So we should expect anything Jesus asked was going to happen. <laughs> because He always did what pleased His Father. Now, certainly we don't, we can't say we all, you know, we, we can't say the way Jesus did it. But we're taught in Scripture. And so that when Jesus spoke, when Jesus prayed, when Jesus healed, there was no sin to block it at all. There was no selfishness, no ulterior motives. There was nothing behind him that would keep him from receiving directly from his father. And of course, doing miracles. Now, think of this, okay? Because you have the Son of Man and the Son of God here. Son of Man, Jesus is praying on earth. Son of God, God is doing miracles through his Son. Son of God. And so there, you know, Jesus is God. 
Such a powerful testimony. Finally, the man's testimony examined honestly the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In uh, verse 33, and this is as far as I've, I've gone today. But he said, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so there's the... The man's willingness to suffer for his testimony supports the idea that he was telling the truth. Let's say he's, he's lying. Let's just say for a minute he's lying. And uh, that, that one day, I don't know, maybe he took some medicine or he went to the witch doctor or something and he was able to see. Let's just say he was lying. If he was lying, would he been, have been able to hold up to the pressure? This is the thing. Remember, one lie leads to another lie. One lie, 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 lie. They're all connected. That's why when a man is saved, the one that used to lie, lies no more. The one who used to steal, steals no more. And if he slips and stumbles, he confesses and finds forgiveness. There's a change in a person when they come to Jesus Christ. A change takes place. So let's just say this man lied, and let's look at his life. Look at verse 9. Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I'm I am He. It's me. I'm the one. I was the one born blind. So it's, that's His clear testimony. Verse 9. Look at verse 17. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about Him? Because He opened your eyes. He said, He's a prophet. Very clear. He's a prophet. Verse 25. He answered and said, Whether He's a sinner or not, I don't know. See how honest He is? Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. If he was a liar, he would have changed his story. He kept his story going. Verse 30. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he's from, yet he has opened my eyes. He's very clear. And now he's about to get put out of the synagogue, which will break him from the community. And it's going to affect his family relationship and everything. And yet, he holds to his testimony. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He held on to it. They were infuriated. He preached to them. This blind man now is a preacher. He preaches to them. And, and uh, they cast him out of the synagogue as a result. The formerly blind man was the first known person going out of the synagogue because he chose to follow Jesus. Wow. All right. Let's close with just a few things and then we'll pray. The real issue here is the person and work of Jesus. What do you say about Him? What do you say about Him? Friend, you, you have to answer that. What do you say about Him? Second, does your religion bring life? How's it going? If you're not following Jesus or, or if your church is your only religion. Maybe church is your religion. You know Christianity is a religion but to know God and to have eternal life is life. It's not religion. Religion is the structure whereby we worship God. How does your religion bring, does it bring you life? Does it bring death, emptiness, and fear? The message of Jesus Christ always brings life to those that believe it. And finally, what are you suffering for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to face rejection, isolation, even a little persecution if it's needed? This man was persecuted even before he was saved. Because of his association with Jesus. Let's pray together.